Hi, I'm Larry Castle here with Ken Brown with episode 91 of That's a Good Question. What is the Church of Christ denomination, part two? Today's episode is the conclusion of one we started two weeks ago. Uh, when we started to answer the question, what is the Church of Christ denomination? And uh, we knew it'd be two parts, but we thought it would be two weeks in a row that we'd handle the two parts. Uh, But in between, we had that leak of the Supreme Court draft decision. Uh, Not decision draft. (laughs) (laughs) Sound like it's about basketball, (laughs) the way I said it. (laughs) Uh, But we thought it was important to deal with that while it was in the news. So we did that. And then today, now, we return to the question, what is the Church of Christ denomination? So I remind everybody that this was a question that was submitted to us mm. by a viewer, listener. And so uh, it's a good time for me to remind you that if you have a question you'd like us to consider, you can send that in to us by emailing us at info at cbctrenton.com. And I repeat that again in the end credits of the show if you forget what that is. Okay. Of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you could just rewind it as well. So it's been two weeks since uh, we've touched on this topic. So why don't you summarize quickly what we discussed, and then we'll try to complete the answer. Okay. Well, the, the Church of Christ and the Christian churches are part of something called the Restoration Movement that seeks to return the church to the beliefs and practices of the first century church, to as the name suggests, to restore the church to what it was and they believe, therefore, to what it was intended to be. It was started when the Restorationist movement started. So the Church of Christ started when the Restorationist movement started. And that was in the early 1800s in America. It was led by a couple of guys, Alexander Campbell and his father, Thomas Campbell. In fact, the distinctive teaching of the Church of Christ and the Christian churches is that one must be baptized for salvation, and that's sometimes called Campbellite, Mm -hmm. after those two, father and son. I don't remember us saying that last week, but now that you say that, I remember hearing that. We did not say that last week, that's right. But Alexander the son, Thomas Campbell the, the father. So the claim by the Church of Christ and the Christian church is that they go back to the very first church in Jerusalem in 33 A.D. And just to re- re- reiterate, yeah. Christian church is another name or another version of the Church of Christ's yes, denomination, right? where they split because of instruments or non-use yeah, yeah, of yeah. instruments. Yeah, okay. exactly. And both claim, though, to go back to 33 A.D., and the first church ever anywhere in Jerusalem. But that's not historically accurate. And as we're going to see, their teaching regarding baptism is not that of the the early church. Hmm. Now, I mentioned that the Church of Christ and the Christian church, uh, I've mentioned those both again today. And last week we saw that while both have the same doctrine regarding this necessity of baptism for salvation, they differ in one major respect, and that is the Church of Christ will not allow musical instruments, Mm. and the Christian Church does allow musical instruments. To put it mildly, and when I say it that way, it's because... (laughs) For, you know, it's interesting for a group that comes out of no instruments, once they adopted instruments, I mean, they've gone all in. Mm. I said last week, you know, sometimes like a concert rock kind of kind of setting. The pendulum has swung. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> this The split, though, between the two, the Church of Christ and the Christian Church, shows a major flaw in the Church of Christ approach and the, uh, the Church of Christ approach which we discussed a bit two weeks ago, and that's namely the the failure to see the difference between form and and function. Mm. And so anything in their mind that's not explicitly mentioned in the New Testament cannot be done. Only the forms that are found in the New Testament are valid, and since the form of music in the New Testament does not mention instruments, though it also says nothing against them, then in that view, they, they can't be used. Mm. Now, they claim to be non-denominational, since in their telling, their church started uh, before there were denominations. But we showed in part one that, in fact, they are a denomination by any known regular use of the word. Yeah, good, good. So that's a helpful review. Uh, if you hadn't had a chance to watch the whole episode, mm-hmm. you can go back and check that out. But this will catch up to speed for yeah. this one. Uh, I, I thought it might be helpful for our listeners also to know that we received a note from uh, somebody who had listened to that first episode on this topic. And uh, they, they uh, the way that uh, we described the Church of Christ and the Christian Church in the first part earned us some kudos hmm. 
from a listener that, and by the way, this is somebody yeah. that we don't know. It's not your, you know, my spouse, your spouse, or <laughs> right. friend of a friend, it's or like even sometimes somebody. When you see those restaurants that say voted, you know, best pizza in town or yeah. something, nobody tells you who voted for that, right? Right, right. That we could've... passed out ballots to everyone <laughs> in my family, and it was unanimous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, no, this is not from somebody we know uh, or who knows us. They're not right. from this area. Right. And uh, this, this gentleman found our pon- podcast through. Uh, kind of a roundabout way. And uh, so shout out to Scott who wrote in to us and uh, just read you a little excerpt here. He says, you were probably as fair and balanced as could be expected from someone who preaches at a Baptist church. So I really what? No, appreciate wait, hold that. Hold on, hold on. We were called fair and balanced. Yes. <laughs> not, not ever to be confused with Fox News. <laughs> I don't think that we're in danger of that. No, no. Who everyone knows... Uh, Everyone knows is our favorite because it's always, in the words of their slogan, fair and balanced. Yeah. I think Brett Baer says at the end of his show that he is fair, balanced, and unafraid. Uh, I don't know if he has that copyright, but I think now we should adopt that. Uh, Thanks for watching. That's a good question. Yeah, fair, balanced. Moving right along. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't know how to take the part for someone who preaches at a Baptist church, yeah, but yeah. I think in the context uh, saying yeah. he knows we don't share the yeah. beliefs we're describing. Yeah, so, yeah, I think uh, that. Well, you, you were taking it maybe as a, a Baptist telling the truth. You know those Baptists, <laughs> right? Okay. You know, I don't think you meant it no, that I don't way. No, he's very gracious and yes. encouraging. Uh, he goes on to say, say, uh, I'm not even going to defend the traditional beliefs that you mentioned because I agree with your points on them. We are denomination in respect of having a name, but we don't have any organization above us other than the colleges and newspapers you mentioned do exist. Uh, I I would guess, he says, as an independent Baptist church, you would have very similar organizational Mm -hmm. structure, Mm -hmm. lack of one. It's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably a better description than what you mentioned as historically we have used. Yeah. Uh, also, he says, uh, you are right that it has always sounded to me pretty ridiculous that we are the only church. I would guess you could get a group of us in a room and ask us about mm-hmm. that. And most of us would agree to that statement, but some would not. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, most of us wouldn't agree to that statement, but mm-hmm. some would. Mm-hmm. And that sounds bad and isn't accurate. I also agree that uh, your points on music, although there are more and more of the churches that have multiple services with or without instruments, I personally prefer congregational singing, but I could go anywhere. Mm, So, yeah. uh, Why don't we just quit there? Quit while we're ahead. (laughs) (laughs) So Church of Christ listener Uh wrote in and uh, proves... Uh, approves of this message. <laughs> so thanks, Scott. Yes. Sincerely, yes. thank you for thank listening, you. Uh, for your helpful comments from you know someone in the denomination or lack of denomination, mm. and uh, for your encouraging comment. Yes. We really appreciate it and appreciate yep. you watching. Yep. So, okay, the Campbells sought <clears throat> to get the church back to the way it believed and behaved in Bible times. Mm-hmm. And that's a, yeah. that's a good thing. I mean, right. we, we want the same thing, right? right. Um, and their followers at least uh, determined that that would mean no instruments. Right. You know, they look, they don't see the instruments described. Mm-hmm. And others split off and said no instruments are okay, mm-hmm. uh, but said the real distinctive teaching is the necessity of baptism for salvation. Right. So that, that last episode ended with you saying very clearly that the Bible does not teach baptism as a requirement for salvation. And we said that we'd look at that in the biblical case for that today. Okay, yep. Well, uh, in starting an answer to that, I want to begin uh, finishing off an issue I introduced in the last episode, but didn't come back to. I I don't expect anybody to remember, but I said my dear saintly late mother uh, had no problem with me leaving the Pentecostal upbringing that I had. Because the truth was, she had never entirely bought into speaking in tongues and the claimed miracles that would occur in our services. But she did maintain a very high regard for the Church of Christ because she had grown up in it. Her dad was a a Church of Christ elder, as was her brother-in-law. Her entire family of good people were Church of Christ. She told me many times that she wishes she had never left Mm -hmm. the uh, the Church of Christ. So she would have been okay with me staying or leaving the, the Pentecostal Church, but she really would have loved it if I had joined the Church of Christ. But the one thing she did not want 
and told me countless times what she did not want me to become a Baptist. And I mentioned that two weeks ago. She did not. Yeah, it sounds like she felt really strongly about it. Mm. So what was her problem with Baptists? Well, you're right. She did feel strongly about it. And the issue was that the Pentecostals and the Church of Christ had something in common that the Baptists do, did not and do not share. Namely, my Pentecostal church and the Church of Christ both believed you could lose salvation. Mm. That is, you could be a Christian with a relationship with God at one point in your life, but you could later lose that relationship. Mm. In other words, they did not believe in what we call, some of our listeners might be familiar with, eternal security. My mom would say with disdain, and, and I've heard others say, say it this way over the years, with disdain in their voice, that Baptists believe in a once saved, always saved idea. I mean, they just think that's preposterous. <laughs> I just, sorry, I just I didn't realize that about that denomination. And just hearing you say that, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I mean, that it would all be by grace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of what I hear, because, but that's through my... Because here's what they think that means. Hmm. It means, and I heard this over and over again growing up, that you can live any way you want and still go to heaven. Uh, and so this is then you become libertine, you become licentious, because, you know, you're not... There's nothing hanging in the balance mm-hmm. with regard to you going to heaven or hell. Mm-hmm. And so that being the case, what's the incentive? That was the, the idea. Yeah. So when I started visiting Baptist churches as a young adult, I expected to encounter these people who were morally lax because how they lived didn't really matter because they were going to heaven no no matter what. Now, what does all that have to do with baptism? Well, the reason a church believes one can lose salvation, like my Pentecostal upbringing, like our our church, the Church of Christ, is because they've developed a works system for salvation. It follows that if you have to work for salvation, then it's possible that for you to fail in that work. Hmm. And so failing to meet the terms, you, you lose it. In other words, if someone tells you you can lose your salvation, it also means they believe in some version of works to gain or maintain, maintain. your salvation. Mm-hmm. That's what most people think salvation involves. Let's, other than the gospel of grace then what you have are all of these different kinds of works-oriented systems. And so my mom believed that at the time that she was making these statements to me. Most denominations have some sort of works arrangement for you to gain or maintain your, your salvation. And that gaining or maintaining is done by works. Now, the particular works that have to be done... The rungs on the ladder that you you have to climb, they're different depending on the denomination. And in fact, that's really at the heart of what is the difference between denominations. Mm. You know, how can I be saved? I mean, there are a lot of other ancillary kinds of things, but how can I have a relationship with God? And you will find that most denominations have some kind of works-oriented system. Uh, So make no mistake, they all have something that you have to do. And when you point out that salvation is not by works in the Bible, then here's what happens. They redefine what is meant by work Mm -hmm. so that the thing they're requiring is not violating the Bible's not by works standard. So, for example... You say not by works standard. That's word for word. word Not by works so that no one can vote. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, for example, Martin Luther used to quote... You know, Romans 3.28. Now, most of our listeners know the name Martin Luther, not to be confused with Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. I've heard people do that. But mm-hmm. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, and he began the Protestant Reformation and did so because he was a Roman Catholic scholar, a monk. Uh, and as he immersed himself in the scriptures, and in particular in the book of Romans, he saw the just shall live by faith, a quotation mm-hmm. from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And here it's used a few times in the New Testament. And he's, he's haunted by that because that's not the system that he's involved in. It's not by faith. It's by works. Mm. And, and so he would quote often uh, Romans 3.28 saying, here, here's what it says, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works. Now, Roman Catholics point out rightly that on the occasions when Luther would quote it that way, he was actually not giving the whole verse. The whole verse actually says, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Hmm. So Roman Catholics will jump on that, and they will say, see, that of the law part is crucial because it's not denying all works for salvation, Hmm. but rather salvation based on those particular works, works of the law in the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, the law of Moses. Now, 
if Luther truncated the quotation, he, he should not have, have done that. And on whatever occasions he did that, he shouldn't have. But more important for our purposes is that he didn't need to do that. Because the context tells us that it's speaking not only about works of the law, but the context actually tells us that we're talking about any works, mm. whether of the law or not. Just five verses after that, five verses after Romans 3.28, you get to chapter 4 in verse 2, and it says, If Abraham was justified by works, now notice, it's not works of the law. If he was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That is this, that mm. Abraham was not justified, declared righteous by God. That's what justified means. It was not by works, but by believing. That's what faith means. And here's something really important. Abraham lived 500 years before Moses, mm -hmm. <laughs> before the law. So if someone says, hey, Brown, you want to talk context, the context was set in chapter 3 and verse 28 when it said works of the law. And now here when Paul uses the illustration of Abram, it's still talking about works of the law. Mm -hmm. Well, not I don't know how, <laughs> mm -hmm. since there was no law mm -hmm. at the time Abram lived 500 years before Moses and the law. So Roman Catholics try to redefine the prohibition against work for salvation by saying, in error, that it's only prohibiting works of the law. Now, in similar fashion, the Church of Christ uh, will sometimes try to say baptism is not in the category of work that's excluded for salvation. So uh, they, too, can avoid running afoul of the many statements in the Bible that tell us that salvation is apart from works. Here's, here's a statement from a Church of Christ website. Here's what it says. Some works will not save. Will not wow. save. Some will not save. Like the works of the law of Moses. Oh, look at that. Wow. Hmm. And, you know, let me just stop there for a second. Uh, my Roman Catholic relatives, or excuse me, my Church of Christ relatives, and I mentioned two weeks ago that I have many and just wonderful people, they were vehemently anti-Roman Catholic doctrine, vehemently. But notice that on something as crucial as hmm. the requirements for salvation, we're at, they're actually in agreement. Yeah. Because I just told you what Roman Catholics say about the works of the law and here, here's a Church of Christ website saying some works won't save, like the works of the law of Moses. Hmm. But then they add, or works of human merit about which one might boast. But, and, and that is exactly things Roman Catholics say, exactly. Hmm. And that's to get around the... Uh, the pro Ephesians, yeah, to exactly. That we want to see, it. yeah. That, that if you can Bible boast said. about it, you can't. Yeah. It, yeah. So it's just about the kind you can boast about. It's just mm -hmm. about the works of the law. So they narrow the category so that it's not all works. Therefore, we can shoehorn in mm -hmm. some kind of works. So they say this website says, keep Bible passages in their context. <laughs> For some works are essential. To one's salvation. That's, that's what they say. We must let the Bible speak for itself. The New Testament repeatedly specifies baptism as a condition to being saved. Mm -hmm. Faith without baptism cannot save. That's what it says. So baptism is a work. They're admitting, yes. A work required for salvation. Yes, they're admitting. Mm -hmm. But when the Bible says salvation is not by work, it's not talking about baptism. It excludes that. It's not talking about the works and the hoops that Roman... Catholics have to go through. It's not talking about that. Mm. You know, it's talking about other kinds of works. Yeah. Uh, it's talking about, you know, the boasting kinds of works of the law of Moses, that kind of thing. I just am noticing you, you quoted this from a Church of Christ mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. I've not seen it communicated that clearly mm -hmm. in some of them. I think it's been the Christian church, and it may mm -hmm. be that they choose mm -hmm. different strategies of, of communication or non-communication. It might be beyond the scope of this conversation. Well, but I mentioned just in passing, well, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. I said that, remember, the Christian church tends to be more seeker mm. Uh, sensitive, secret Marketing driven. savvy. Correct. Mm, I see. Uh, and, that, and there's part of the music thing and all mm -hmm. of that. It's much more attractive to outsiders. Well, in keeping with that, they don't just lay it out there. Mm. Uh, and there, therefore, I had such a difficult time with yeah. these Christian church pastors trying to nail down, okay, is it baptism or not? Remember, I mentioned right, that two right. weeks ago. So that's not surprising. On the other hand, most of the, the Church of Christ, and especially those who you know are kind of old school, they yeah. just tell you what it is. But 
same same idea. Gotcha. Okay. So the Church of Christ requires baptism for yep. salvation, but says it's not a work. Right. Is so they're recategorizing mm-hmm. uh, in that case. So let's give listeners some of the passages that separate yeah. works yeah. Um, that that talk about this topic of works versus how one is really saved. Yeah. So you mentioned the famous passage in Ephesians two eight nine, the one that God used graciously in my own life for me to be reading at age nineteen in my bedroom and to turn the light on for my need for Christ outside of any work on my part and to gain it or maintain it. Mm-hmm. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's the Greek word is the same word for belief through belief, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Mm-hmm. And then there's the Romans 3:28 that I mentioned, we hold that no one is justified by uh, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So yes, that says it's about the law, but just understand this with regard to a verse like that. The law was God's list. I mean, are we really going to say that we can improve on God's list? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not this is what is being said. You need to understand Brown. You need to understand Martin Luther. It's not that list. It's this list. Mm. Oh, we got Mm -hmm. a better list. We have an improved list. I don't think so. Even in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21, and Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. I just encourage our our listeners to keep those two in mind, easy to memorize the, the references at least, 321, 221. And 321 says, if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Mm. Now, it's interesting the way it says that. If a law, if any law, could have imparted life, then it certainly would have come by the one God gave, the law, the law of Moses. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then 221 says, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You put those two together. If righteousness could be gained by any list of rules, Mm -hmm. Christ died for nothing. Now, I'm just going to pause. I'll I'll move on. But I just want everybody to understand the stakes here are extremely high. Paul, the Apostle Paul, connects whether or not you're going to have some list of rules, including whatever works you want to shoehorn in. He attaches that to the value you place on the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ died for nothing if it's going to be based upon works, any kind of works. And then you've got Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, his belief is counted as righteousness. So faith isn't work either. Correct. Mm-hmm. A faith is de- most definitely not a work, mm-hmm. although sometimes people try to say that. Right, right. You know, but you go to the book of James, and James contrasts faith mm-hmm. and works, doesn't mm-hmm. he? Mm-hmm. Very definitely. The famous John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. Um, you've got Acts chapter 13 uh, and verse 38 saying, Through this man, Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed, is justified. That's the word for justified. From everything which you could not be freed, justified from, by the law of, of Moses. Remember the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter uh, 16. And he's worried about his own physical life, but also spiritual life. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No works attached you know, to it. John 5, 24, here's Jesus. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life mm-hmm. and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. John 5, 24. That, that verse eliminates any work to gain or maintain, especially maintain your salvation. It, it actually eliminates the possibility mm-hmm. that anyone could lose their salvation. Now, what I've just gone through there is what's called the analogy of Scripture, that, that one passage cannot contradict another that mm-hmm. might seem to say work is required. If other passages clearly teach that that's impossible, then it can't be the case in some other passage. Yeah, and we kind of mentioned in passing last week, too, there's a thief on the cross mm. who uh, is 
said to be in paradise. Jesus right. says, you'll be with me in yeah. paradise, and he didn't have a chance but to you be gotta baptized. Make an, you got, so what do you do with that, right? Mm-hmm. So the Church of Christ says this. Yeah, but that was before Jesus died. <laughs> That's what that, I'm telling okay. you. That was before Jesus died hmm. on the cross, so it does not count as an example of salvation without baptism. I had a, a gentleman tell me one time, he, I discovered after the fact he was from Church of Christ, he was trying to encourage me to, mm-hmm. talking about baptism, encouraging me to come to his church, and he said that uh, that it was important that you be willing, so the thief was willing to be baptized. Mm. I don't know if that would be official doctrine, but mm. that was his okay. description of it. Gotcha. So, well. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, baptism is really, really important. Not I guess. Baptism is really, really important, yes. um, even if it's not required for salvation. Yeah, so we're is. not disputing no, that, no, no, no. that baptism is important. No. I mean, after all, we're, right. we're Baptists. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Community Bible Church, first page on the About Us on our website, talks about our Baptist heritage. Correct. And uh, so we are Baptists. We believe in the importance of baptism. We believe that it's for believers, mm-hmm. that it's only for believers, uh, those who are saved, already saved. Mm-hmm. And uh, because it's so important, and it's assumed that any true believer will willingly get baptized, there are passages that show that close connection between Correct. believing and being baptized. Right. And at first reading, sometimes people read those, hmm. and it could sound like baptism That's is right. a requirement. Can we talk about it? Yeah, about those? Well, you have to, right. And it is true. You go through some passages in the New Testament because baptism followed very closely on believing, then they're used in the same context. They're mm-hmm. used very closely together, and they can, I admittedly, then look like that baptism is part of the transaction for, for being saved. Mm-hmm. Baptism is very important as a first step of obedience for a new Christian, and because it was the first step, you often find it in connection with believing and repenting when someone first comes to Christ. Since in the first century they happened so close in time, it can look like baptism was required for salvation. I mean, here's mm-hmm. an example, uh, one that's used. This is the verse that's used most often by Church Christ advocates of baptism for salvation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, you know, that sounds like you, you repent, you believe, you're baptized. Three things required for the forgiveness mm-hmm. of sins. Mm-hmm. Repent, believe, be baptized. Um, but the, the preposition for is, comes right after the, the baptism. And it's a, Gre- a Greek preposition, for anybody who cares, uh, the Greek preposition <laughs> ace. Um, but whether in English or in Greek, for, ace, can mean in order to or because of. So we often use the preposition for in English as in order to. Go to the store for bread. Mm. We're saying go to the store in order to get bread. And if that's how it's being used in Acts 2.38, then that would be you'd be baptized in order to have your sins forgiven. Uh, That would mean baptism is required for salvation. But we also use for, and in Greek and in your New Testament, this Greek preposition ace is sometimes used the same way to mean Because of, not in order to. Mm -hmm. So we might say at a retirement party, I'm giving you this gift for your retirement. Mm -hmm. That means I'm giving it because of the fact that you've retired, not I'm giving you this in order to get you to retire. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that would be called a severance. (laughs) No, you're having the party because they're, they're already retired. And likewise, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins means to be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins that you've already received. Now, uh, Dr. Bruce Compton from uh, my alma mater, uh, school that you've taken many classes at, uh, Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary, Mm -hmm. he's written a couple of little articles on this that are very easy to understand that maybe we could make available. Yeah, I think we can. If you look in the video description below this, we'll we'll do our best to link to them, assuming the links are available. I think they probably are. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to have another one to a different okay, article sure. later as yeah, well. Okay, sure. Yeah, put them all in the show. So notes. here's another passage, Acts 22 and verse 16, that makes that close connection. Here is here is the Apostle Paul talking about his conversion uh, experience uh, when the Lord tells him to go and meet with a man named Ananias, and then he Paul gets mm-hmm. baptized, uh, but he was Saul of Tarsus, his Jewish name at the time. And so here's Paul recounting all of that in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And uh, he says, I was told, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, 
calling on his name. Now, one commentator says this, the phrase, wash your sins, is connected with calling on his name. Paul's sins were washed away, not by baptism, but by calling on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 13, this same Paul wrote, he who calls on the name of the Lord will be Mm -hmm. saved, Mm -hmm. uh, quoting the Old Testament. The literal translation of that verse uh, is, arise, get yourself baptized, and your sins washed away, having called on his name. Mm -hmm. Having called on his name. So interestingly, this is about Paul's own baptism, and if he thought baptism were required for salvation, he missed a lot of chances to say so in his letters later on. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one who wrote so much about our justification being apart from from works, remember. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, he gives a summary of the gospel that he preached and by which the Corinthians had been saved, no mention, interestingly, of Mm -hmm. baptism. Mm -hmm. And in the first chapter of that book, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, he rejoiced that he had baptized none of the Corinthians Mm. except Crispus Gaius and the household of Stephanus. Now that's inexplicable if baptism is necessary for salvation. Paul would in effect be saying he's thankful that only those few were saved under his ministry. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. The apostle, so the apostle Paul clearly distinguishes baptism from the gospel in uh, that same chapter, and at the next verse, verse seventeen, he says this: "Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel." Mm-hmm. So, how could he have made such a statement if, if baptism is necessary for salvation? Right. right? right. Here's here's another. Uh, quickly, a few more, because I just want to make sure that people know we're not trying to sure. avoid these passages. First Peter 3 and verse 20 says this, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Uh-oh. Mm. Baptism now saves you. But then it goes on to say right after that this, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. So it starts to explain what it means by this baptism saving you, a clear conscience toward God. And then it goes on to say this, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what it's saying is that baptism symbolizes, that's why we immerse, Mm -hmm. right? The death, Mm -hmm. the burial, the resurrection of Christ. And it's baptism that symbolizes that resurrection of Christ by which you are actually actually saved. Now, sometimes those who believe, like the Church of Christ does, and the Christian Church does, that you have to be baptized to be saved, that's sometimes called baptismal regeneration. Mm-hmm. Now, they chafe at that. Um, no, we don't believe that, and I'll talk about why in a minute. But baptismal regeneration. Regeneration means the giving of spiritual life. So the idea of baptismal regeneration is that you are given spiritual life when you get baptized. And they believe this, John, cha- and it's from John chapter 3. Now, many of our listeners will remember what John chapter 3 is. It starts with this dialogue between Jesus and a Pharisee, a leader, a Jewish leader, religious leader, Nicodemus. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again, except mm-hmm. you are born again. Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and then, but Jesus says in verse 5 there, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, here's this other article that I mentioned. Dr. Robert McCabe from Detroit Seminary Mm -hmm. has an article on this whole thing where he shows it means the cleansing and transformation that's produced by the Spirit, not baptism. Baptism is not even mentioned Mm -hmm. there at Mm -hmm. all. Um, But let me just add something to this about the context of John chapter 3. Here's Jesus saying to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He does mention water in the Spirit. Dr. McCabe explains what that is. It's the work of the Spirit, water symbolizing the work of the Spirit in the Old Testament many times. But Jesus goes on to say this in verse 8 of uh, John chapter 8. He says that the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, it... This is interesting, I think, to help you understand what Jesus is doing here. It's kind of a play on words Mm -hmm. because the word pneuma uh, for spirit, Greek word, uh, is translated spirit, sometimes uh, translated breath or wind. Mm -hmm. And so when he says the wind blows wherever it pleases, it's the same word for spirit. Mm -hmm. You hear its sound. But it's true in the physical realm that that's the deal with the wind. You hear its sound. You can't tell where it comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In other words, you don't control it. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You don't control the wind, and you don't control the spirit. Now, here's here's my point. If John chapter three were talking about baptism, then you would control it by scheduling it. Mm-hmm. You would control it by saying, okay, I'm getting baptized now. Now I can be given spiritual life. And you don't control it. You don't control that. And Jesus made that clear. So it can't be about something that you schedule. Yeah, yeah. So what about the accompanying action of giving the gospel mm. for regeneration? Okay. You know, those happen at the same time, but we wouldn't say regeneration is caused by our action of giving the gospel. Okay, so you're making that quite... Okay, I'm saying, look, you can't, it can't be baptism that accompanies regeneration, mm-hmm. because otherwise that would make regeneration beholden to something that you schedule, that you determine by right, like baptism. Right. But you're saying, but yeah, it's... But regeneration doesn't come apart from the gospel, mm-hmm. so we have involvement in that. That is true, but here's a big difference. In giving the gospel, we can never assume a cause and effect in every case. Mm. That is because I gave the gospel, I can't assume that the Spirit will give life to that person. True. We don't know, mm. and we don't control. Mm-hmm. But yes, when the Spirit does give life, He does so in conjunction with the if presentation of the gospel. Hearing, hearing by the Word. But just because you gave the word doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it faithful. So I'm not controlling yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Baptism, you would be. If baptism is the attendant agent of regeneration, the giving of spiritual life, then every time someone is baptism, they'd be regenerated. Mm-hmm. Every time. Baptismal regenerists now, regenerationists, uh, believe that everyone they baptize is in fact regenerated at that point. Now, I mm-hmm. said earlier, they object to that baptismal regeneration mm-hmm. term because they say, and this is what my uncle used to tell me, it suggests something mystical about the water. And mm-hmm. he's saying, look, it's just water. It, there's nothing magic about it. Okay, they don't believe you're regenerated by something in the water. Uh, that's true. But they do believe you're regenerated because of being baptized, which is, in fact, baptismal regeneration. Yeah. So let me you, just give a few loose ends here. Your obedience, you're saved because of your obedience, not yeah. because of your belief. That's right. Yeah. Uh, a work. You're yeah. saved by a work. Yeah. Now, a few loose ends here. Anyone who, let me make clear, I, we, we're in saying this as Baptists, are in no way devaluing baptism. It is closely aligned, as we saw in some of these mm-hmm. verses, mm-hmm. with when someone believes it's expected that they will get baptized. And frankly, anyone who doesn't want, is not willing to be baptized, calls their own salvation into question. I mean, I would uh, not, we would not, we would not allow someone to join our church who is unwilling to to be Mm -hmm. baptized for that very reason, because it calls into question, have you really trusted Christ if you're not willing to follow him in obedience? But it's a subsequent act of obedience after you have been saved. Mm -hmm. I also want this loose end tied up. My dear mom did come around uh, before Mm -hmm. she died, and she did join our church. And also, uh, let me also make clear that in defending our position and refuting the position of others, I don't think you have to be Baptist in order to go to heaven, but I always ant, uh, add, why take a chance? <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the uh, couple of things you said. That reminds me of the old joke. I won't go into it, but uh, Baptists thinking they're the only ones oh, in yeah, heaven. Right, right, that right. one. Yeah, look it up. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, at the end here, let's go back to uh, Scott, our listeners' oh, comments yeah. from prior episode. Uh, this listener who's a part of the Church of Christ, he said it well. He said, I agree with your contention about baptism, but I would guess I'm in the minority on that in the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. I do think the Bible says you should be baptized, Mm -hmm. but it's more of an obedience issue, which is exactly how we describe it. Yeah. Uh, He goes on to say, I do hear most often from our pulpit that you obtain the Holy Spirit during baptism, Mm -hmm. which I don't think is completely true as the book of Acts has many examples of it working differently in practice. Mm -hmm. And also, you kind of need some Holy Spirit working in you to prompt you for your need for Jesus. Yes. Amen to that, right? That's right. (laughs) So uh, we hope this second episode is as accurate and as helpful for you as the first, Scott. And we, Mm -hmm. again, appreciate your uh, interaction and watching. So that's it for then this episode. Uh, If you haven't already, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the notification bell so you know when new episodes come out and we try to release those every Saturday at 2 and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. If you have a question you'd like us to consider, you can send that into our email address info at cbctrenton.com or text it to us at 97000.